Good morning, dear folks. Uh, oh, and Roger has joined us as well. Uh, good morning, dear folks, and welcome to the last talk before a summer break, where we will be on your wavelength in September with an amazing program, or even two or three. Do join us and find out. But of today, we have today our friend Barney Smith, who is has an intriguing title for us, which is Early Quakers. Why they were right to be wrong. <laughs> Barney. Yes, I suppose I'd better come out in the open as to what I think they were wrong about. And this may be a little bit of a surprise to you, because what we mostly record and remember about George Fox and the early friends are the things which they got right and the things which we still applaud and celebrate. And we're inclined to um, gloss over or just not report uh, to each other and other people the things they got wrong. Um, and the particular things they got wrong, which we tend to neglect, is that they thought they was at their particular time in history a unique and new incursion of the experience of Jesus Christ in their lives and that this was part of um, Christ coming to take over the world and reclaim it um, um, as his kingdom and that this was going to happen and this was this no wasn't going to happen this was happening um, and um, I want to now just leap, put that on the shelf for the moment and go back to the particular time of um, 1652 and what led up to it. And there are two things which are, are two streams of history which need to be brought into focus to make sense of all this. Um, and that is um, religion, and this is a European uh, picture, and um, the politics, which is a particular um, thing for the four nations um, of um, what's um, Britain and Ireland. Um, but in religion, the, now, so, a lot of this will be familiar, but little bits of it may not be familiar to some of you. Um, the European um, religious structure at the beginning of the um, 16th century was basically Catholic with a few um, Lollards and similar ones scattered around Europe who actually um, thought that uh, the Bible didn't really justify all the structures and practices of the Catholic Church, but they were few and far in between and pretty well persecuted. But in the 16th century Europe, the people who are protesting against the Catholic Church's practice actually gained some hold of political power and you're familiar with Luther and um, uh, gaining political power in um, several of the German states um, and um, introducing the Lutheran church which um, stripped many of the superstitious and um, somewhat inventive Catholic practices um, from parts of Germany. And in Switzerland, there was um, Zwingli in um, Baal, was it? Z Zurich, and Calvin in um, Geneva, who had um, uh, the backing of their um, uh, city states, effectively, um, and were able to introduce uh, a reformed version of Christianity in those areas. This was happening in. Um, Central Europe in the 16th century, and not much of a ripple really reached um, England at that time. Um, but a ripple did, and um, one of the ripples um, proved very useful to um, Henry VIII, who was in, who was a Catholic, a very devout Catholic in his own way, um, and um, 
awarded a title by the Pope for his efforts, um, who wanted to split from Rome um, in order to get a divorce. And um, so um, the English or the British, because um, um, Henry ruled Ireland as well as um, Wales and England, um, broke away from Catholic Church, and that allowed um, a few Protestant reforms to creep into the um, what was really an Anglican Catholic Church. Um, and um, under Thomas Cromwell and Anne Boleyn, um, that crept forward significantly um, with the um, introduction of the Bible in, in English language into the churches and um, the dissolution of monasteries. But then came Edward VI, who had been brought up a Protestant in the more or less in the reform tradition. And the Re Protestant reforms started going ahead fairly solidly. Um, uh, but that was cut short by him dying and Mary taking over and turning the English church back into a Catholic one. Because nobody was consulted about this. This was all top down stuff. Um, and um, people were used to top down stuff and most people swallowed it, but question marks in their head must have been growing and the um, uh, Protestant thinking continued to grow and ideas continued to come across from the continent. Um, and then along comes Elizabeth, who again was pretty well a Catholic, um, but um, she had a, a Protestant mother and she tried to steer the English church um, in a sort of compromise way between the Catholic tradition and the Protestant tradition. She was um, uh, probably quite a brilliant politician and um, that's what she tried to do, hold it all together. Then came James I, brought up a Presbyterian in Scotland and um, encouraged moves towards the reformed tradition. It's interesting that it's a reformed tradition um, which mostly comes to Britain rather than the Lutheran. So it's uh, Calvinist um, via, a lot of it via the Netherlands where um, uh, the reformed uh, version of Protestantism was um, very significant. Um, and so under James I, we shifted in a, uh, uh, reformed or sometimes in this island called Presbyterian tradition, the, the, the Scots Reformed Church. Um, the Scottish had had it, their Protestant Reformation and it was led by Knox, who was a, a Calvinist. And so they were very much in the reformed tradition in Scotland by the time James was born and brought up. And so that came down to England. But then James's son, Charles, um, I think his mother may have been Catholic, I'm not sure. But anyway, he was much more of an Anglo-Catholic. And so we started shifting back towards Catholic practices. Um, so at the same time, more and more of another tradition was seeping into Britain, as well as the Lutheran and Calvinist Reformation, which historians call the magisterial reformation because it was imposed by the powers that be, whether princes or um, councillors in um, uh, Geneva cities. But this was imposed from above, magisterial reformation. People were told, you are now Protestants and this is the way you will worship and behave. Um, but alongside that, there was a radical reformation going on of people who had access particularly to the Bible in the German language and um, increasingly in other um, uh, native languages, not just in Latin. And they started thinking for themselves and saying, it's not up to the state to tell us what to believe. We can read the Bible and work it out for ourselves. And that's the radical reformation. And um, they were suppressed by both the magisterial reformation um, and by the Catholics, of course. And uh, my, my sort of generalization is the Protestants tended to turn them into refugees and the Catholics just killed them. Um, but that's a generalization. But it wasn't very nice being a 
a part of the radical reformation in parts of Europe, and that persecution continued. The best known um, remnants of that, um, quite significant remnants, are the Mennonites, who have various different um, uh, groupings around the world. The Amish are probably the most well known because they're the most visible, but most Mennonites sitting around a Zoom screen would look much like us. And um, there's a, a lot of them went to the States. There's a lot of um, um, transport between Germany, Netherlands and the States um, of Mennonites escaping from Protestant and from um, Lutheran and Reformed and Catholic repression. So these ideas were coming across into Britain. Um, not in any particularly organised way. There are various groups or individuals who were uh, known and wrote, but um, a lot of it was word of mouth and people travelling around um, and talking to people and sharing ideas and people just coming to their own conclusions without being told. Um, so this was the early part of the 17th century, the first half of the 17th century. Um, new ideas from the continent were coming in to Britain. Um, that's the religious background. Is there any language I've used there which needs to be pulled apart, teased apart and explained? Then there is English politics. The King and Parliament couldn't get on together. The King needed Parliament to raise money, but didn't think um, he really need, ought to. He thought he was a, a monarch with the divine right of kings and should rule and um, was just not a very diplomatic character. Um, and anyway, the king and parliament disagreed with each other and ended up going to war. And you all know about that. And um, parliament um, had two allies. Um, after all, parliament was mostly composed of... Um, um, rich landowners, both the House of Lords and the House of Commons. It wasn't exactly a people's parliament, very limited electoral franchise, but they did um, have two very significant allies in that radicals, political and religious, sided with parliament and um, were able to be recruited into Cromwell's army, um, which came known as the New Model Army, and became an effective organised fighting force. And the Presbyterians in Scotland, who were um, much more sympathetic towards Parliament than they were to um, this rather Anglo-Catholic Charles I. Um, so um, the um, king was defeated, but um, didn't accept defeat and uh, rose again to fight again and therefore was convicted of treason by a parliamentary committee and beheaded, which is a pretty shocking thing for a country which has never not had a king of one or queen of one sort or another. Um, and um, the other thing which, um, of course, what happened in the New Model Army is that all these rather keen radical people talked to each other. And some of them didn't just talk, but they preached so-called agitators. And they didn't draw a line between religion and politics. They tended to address both together. Um, they saw them as the way in which society was organized um, was integral and you couldn't split them apart. And there were characters like um, Gerard Wynne Stanley, who called himself the um, true leveller, um, who later on became a Quaker, but he um, uh, tried um, taking over la land and using it, um, redistributing land. But And James Naylor, uh, he was another agitator in the New Model Army, um, a quartermaster, um, a respected um, administrator and an articulate um, preacher, a street corner preacher in the New Model Army. Um, these people cut their teeth in the New Model Army, but the New Model Army was suppressed with the help of the 
Scottish Presbyterian army, when the new model army started making demands of government that there should be reforms in the electorate and um, particularly electoral reforms, but other reforms as well. And um, the gentry suddenly realised that if you had electoral reform, somebody might question their ownership of the land. And so the New Model Army had to be suppressed and the Presbyterians from Scotland were brought in to do that. So the New Model Army, or large parts of it, were effectively defeated. Uh, so the political ambitions, oh, and the leaders jailed or beheaded. Um, uh, so that they were effectively dispersed as a... As a, as a as a religious and political force. And the other thing is we had a couple of cold, wet summers. People were hungry and miserable. So you've got a very, very febrile situation of people who have been told to worship in this way and told to worship in that, never quite sure whether it's the king or parliament who's going to win the civil war. Um, their radical hopes crushed and they're half starved. And then you've got George Fox comes along. Um, and the message that the world was about to be taken over by Jesus Christ coming again, and that Jesus Christ was already speaking to people in their hearts, um, was a very welcome message. George Fox, um, that's what was particularly behind the early preaching of George Fox. He picked up from people like Martha Simmons, who was effectively the first Quaker, and George Fox sort of credits her with being convinced some years before he met her. Um, and um, after meeting Martha Simmons, he then went off across um, the northeast of England and then across to the northwest. Um, meeting all sorts of radical Protestants and um, building, beginning to build up more of a network. There's already a network. He could travel from one household to another, uh, from one church to another, where there were sympathetic radical Protestants. Um, but he got the idea of building a movement. And there's a famous vision on Pendle Hill where he um, has the idea of building a movement of all these people. Um, and then he meets Margaret Fell, who um, was an incredibly able administrator, member of the aristocracy, married to a, uh, a, a, um, a member of the parliament of the um, Commonwealth Parliament, also a judge for the North West of England, a very well connected woman, um, uh, uh, wealthy and well connected, and a good old administrator, and. The Quaker movement takes off with the Valiant 60 and everything. But they're not just preaching the sorts of Quakerism we know of. They're preaching something which was very much welcomed by in this febrile, disappointed, miserable world of the post-Civil War cold, wet summers. And so the movement would probably have never taken off all this, all the willingness to refuse cap on us, not swear oaths, um, look after each other by um, contributing, uh, sharing their wealth to look after the ones who needed it. This movement would probably have never taken off without the expectation, as with the early church, the world was effectively coming to an end very shortly in a way which wasn't going to be something which they brought about by feet of arms. They were quite clear about that, but that Christ was going to do it himself in some way. Um, but that part of it, uh, so I say they were right to be wrong. If they hadn't got the misapprehension that um, this was a very special event in history, which um, with no precedent and uh, the longed for expectation of the Christian tradition was happening in their time. If it hadn't been for that appeal, I suspect um, a lot of the harder
Have we lost Barney? The late part of the Commonwealth Government and particularly the... Um, but Barney, you, you froze just now. I don't know um, how much Are we you lost. Are you back? Where, where, where was I? We, where lost, was I? we lost a couple of sentences, Barney. Uh, um, so um, it, under the persecution of the later Commonwealth period, and particularly under the restoration of Charles II, Quakers changed their tune. And so by the time George Fox writes his journal, he doesn't really tell it quite as he told it in 1652. And by the time people like William Penn come along and um, share ideas of universal um, uh, inspiration um, uh, across different faiths and times, um, it's a different song which the Quakers are singing to the one they sang in the first few years. And um, we're in time to forget that. And I think there's a tendency amongst Quakers, um, some Quakers today, if only we got back to the original message of the early Quakers, we would get 10% of the population of Bristol as Quakers. And we would get um, uh, hundreds of people around um, the country and across the world to become Quakers. Um, and I think they couldn't be more wrong. We'd be laughed out of court. Um, so that's it. I've blasted you. I've ranted at you now for um, 20 minutes. Um, so you can have a go at me. Gordon. Muted. Gordon, you're muted. We can't hear a word. Is that better? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I was born and brought up as a, an enthusiastic Methodist. And looking back, I was, I've always been surprised that the Quakers didn't make the kind of progress that were that was made in the following century under John Wesley. Wesley seemed to, to address the ordinary people or keep them together in a particular way that the Quakers didn't manage. And um, I have my own ideas about how that happened. But there's an interesting little story which underlines this I've come across recently. And it is, uh, it would make a wonderful novel by somebody who's prepared to put in all their historical trimmings. But in 1739, a baby was born to a woman whose name was Pillmore, and the father was a man called Ford, who was a Quake Methodist, sorry, a Quaker from Darlington. You know, Darlington was one of the big centres. And as a result of that, Ford was expelled from the movement, which says something about how the Quakers were having to protect their position. Well, young Pillmore grew up and he, he it's obviously this was in, in a family that was well off. Young Pillmore um, went, was sent to Kingswood School near Bath, which is uh, a Methodist founded school. And there and his friend from a near another little village, well, the village itself was tiny, minute. It's some, does, well, I don't know how far it is from Darlington, 20 miles, I should imagine. Tiny, tiny little village. I assume that the family was fairly off because they sent um, their son, the Pilmore sent the son to Kingswood, where he and his friend from another northern village um, heard Wesley preach and were con ca absolutely captivated by him and became part of his team that went round the country. When Pilmore, when Wesley um, went to America, um, Pilmore went with him, and when Wesley had to return, um, Pilmore stayed on and is generally regarded as the real foundation of Methodism in America. He, he was, you know, credited with this at the time. And here, what this, I'd say it's a, something is inadequate in the way 
perhaps it couldn't be avoided, but in the way that the Quakers established their movement, um, which prevented them from doing what Wesley would did um, the following, you know, the following century. Um, it's uh, a fascinating story. I've not come across this much of this history before, um, but it underlines the fact that, as I say, Wesley was able to speak out and keep together the people who approved of what he was doing. And this young Pilmore, a uh, sort of cast out from the Quaker movement, um, uh, actually encouraged this. But as I say, I think I think Wesley had um, something in the way that his followers um, were attracted. To. Just like the early Quakers, Wesley was wrong. Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think being was wrong right. and being attractive are not um, um, contradictory, um, and unfortunately, being wrong and attractive is um, almost um, goes together. Um, you take the Nazi movement in Germany, for instance, in the aftermath of the First World War. Um, it's not easy to be wrong and attractive. Um, Wesley got some things right as well, um, particularly um, um, uh, mobilizing and um, t um, making the, um, the working class articulate and um, uh, able to organize themselves, the, the method. Um, so uh, quite a lot of Methodism was um, very, very good. But uh, also, but I think we'd say the, the evangelical message that um, um, the only way that God could cope with sin in the world was to have his son murdered um, is sort of just doesn't make sense. And I don't think we'd want to promote it, but it made sense to the people Wesley was was, was preaching to. But um, I don't think we should uh, we, we should be aware of um, being um, just going for what is attractive. Yes. Um, well, I, um, I don't want to push this too far, but um, I've always felt that what Wesley was doing through his brother Charles was creating um, a ritual of song. And, uh, you know, when you've, got a, as you, when you've got a crowd together, they can unite themselves with this unit. And, and at the same time, with a good song, you can learn a deal that they learned of the message that they, um, people like Wesley wanted to put across. It's the ritual that um, you know the, that really helped ke keep these people together. And you could say that is a very subtle and effective form of brainwashing to have a, a, a message wrapped up in a song. Um, so yeah, I. I can be, I'm being deliberately provocative here. Yeah. Roger. Hello. Uh, thanks very much, um, Barney, for that uh, magisterial account of the uh, history of the Reformation. I thought it was terrific. Um, uh, just a quick comment on the on the previous discussion about Methodism. It seems, no, I mean, one of the problems for Quakers would have been their austerity and, if you like, Puritanism. Um, uh, although they weren't Puritans, they were very much influenced by the the social um, uh, attitude of the of the Puritans, as I understand it, and uh, and so that produced a very austere and therefore not very attractive. Um, uh, you know, another example of perhaps being right, but uh, not not successful in that sense. Um, I, I'd like to go back, though. Uh, I, I unfortunately the, your, the point at which you froze, I lost a bit of the track. Um, you say that there was a marked change in the in the Quaker position in sixteen uh, in, in, at the time of the Restoration. Um, and uh, I, I wonder if you could expand on that, on the comparison between pre-Restoration Quakerism and post-Restoration post, um, and um, what you think was right and wrong about it. Um, initially, the um, Quakers were very aggressive towards the powers that be 
and particularly the Church of England. Yeah. Um, they thought that they were going to fall and that the Quakers would particularly be um, part of that, um, uh, making people realise that they those bodies did not have the authority they thought they had, um, partic but, and particularly the church. Um, the um, Fox was not as hot on the social agenda as people like Wynne Stanley and Naylor, um, who actually almost word for word um, wrote uh, their pamphlets. You can almost line by line compare them. They were so close. Um, and um, so th this was a very aggressive uh, um, movement, um, trying to cause as much problem as possible. Um, towards the end of the Commonwealth period, um, a lot of the leaders of the um, Quaker movement, Fox in particular, but some others, were taking a much more conciliatory approach towards the government. And Naylor and his um, trial for so-called blasphemy um, was a significant embarrassment to them. Um, <laughs> the ones who disliked this move towards being conciliatory towards the powers that be um, tended to home in and support James Naylor as their champion against Fox. And I don't think Naylor particularly saw himself that way, but he was seen by others as that way. And so the downfall of Naylor was, to a certain extent, seized upon by um, the, the, the compromising Quakers um, as, uh, as an excuse to exert a bit more um, control over the movement and stop excessive language and excessive behaviour um, and s s um, make sure that things are, are, are read by a committee before they're print printed and published. And that was already happening towards the end of the Commonwealth period. By the time the Restoration period comes in and they realise that politically they're done for and in terms of capturing the Church of England they're done for and in terms of the expected takeover by Christ of all the powers in the world um, was clearly um, gone, completely gone by board and not not mentioned. Um, so they were they were they were drawing in their um, antennae and keeping their heads down and thinking about surviving more than being aggressive and assertive. But it was not a change which happened at one point in time, but the restoration was pretty significant in terms of the tipping point as to where, when Quakers ceased to be an assertive, aggressive movement and a people who were um, surviving, a community which was surviving. Indeed. Yeah, epitomised, of course, by the 1660 statement, which we tend to, to sort of... Um... Uh, bow down to as the as the source of the, of the peace testimony, but um, I don't think it is. I think that the the real source of the peace testimony is uh, is George Fox's response when he was invited to become a member of the army. Um, yes, and there are other other examples. There'll be other examples, obviously, um, um, doing it spontaneously. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, so the, I mean. I, I think we've got ourselves in a little bit. <laughs> we've got ourselves in the wrong position by our our veneration of the 1660 statement, which is really a a, a statement of what you just said about um, uh, uh, we're going to go along with the uh, with the powers that be. Mm. We're going to we're, we're not going to be as radical as we were. Which I think it's a mistake, personally. <laughs> That's for another day, perhaps. Um, Barney, you, uh, within Bristol at the time of Fox and his things and that which were going along, Bristol was quite radical, quite Quaker. It was, you know, there are, there are facts to say there are quite vast numbers of Quakers in Bristol. And that has slowly gone down. What do you think the reason for that could be? 
Um, I think around the time of Naylor, people were suggesting that possibly 10% of the population of Bristol would have thought of themselves as Quakers. Um, when the first Quakers arrived in Bristol, the first gig they got by invitation was to the Red Lodge, the summer house of one of the richest merchants in Bristol. Mm. Um, they were the they were the latest rock band to hit Bristol, and um, <laughs> uh, were asked to do a performance at the Red Lodge. Uh, this was after interrupting a church um, service in. Broadmead and then um, having an open air meeting in Broad Plain. Um, so, um, yes, Bristol did um, was full of radical people who were well, full of, had a large number of radical people who, were pick, who had picked up ideas. Um, uh, there was a significant Baptist community in Bristol um, who uh, at least brought one of the main ideas of the um, radical reformation forward that it was not up to the state to baptize infants that baptism was a matter of individual adult choice um, which is a very significant feature of um, uh, the rad um, radical reformation um, they were called anabaptist or rebaptizers which was the insult which was put at them because they wouldn't call themselves rebaptizers because they'd say infant baptism was no baptism at all it was only adult baptism whether by water or the spirit but um uh but, so bristol was a lively place theologically and probably a lot of people were taken up um by the new quaker um rock band hit bristol by the time of the persecution in Bristol and the children holding the meeting and the adults put in prison, you're talking about hundreds, not thousands. So the uh, myth that Quakers thrived under persecution, I think, is a little bit overspun. We didn't persecution didn't we didn't die out under persecution because as fast as people were falling away under persecution and what Roger mentioned the austerity of the Quaker community the puritanical um, affectations of the Quaker community in other parts of the country people were newly discovering Quakers and so there'd be uh, and it depended very much which bit of your country and who was the local landowner and who was the local judge, whether Quakers were being persecuted or given free reign. So different things were happening in different places. But yeah, persecution was not the friend of Quakers. A lot of people dropped away. David. Yeah, yeah, great. This is really interesting, full of full of useful information and observation. Uh, and I've I've I'm I've got a got a kind of perspective that I'd like to bounce off you, Barney, and see if it uh, has any relevance in uh, in in your way of looking at things. When I came across Quakers, it was initially through social action, which I approved of, uh, and through um, participative governance, which I approved of, non-hierarchical, but um, I was reluctant. Well, th that was just an observation. Uh, and but what I was really interested in was whether Fox had really had some genuine, deep, mystical experience. Uh, and I'm thinking of how this happens with individuals uh, and sort of um, Abraham Maslow, actually, that that people who uh, are have an integrated spiritual and material life start off with some kind of deep breakthrough, which Maslow calls a peak experience, and then find ways to sort of layers of structuring it into the world, and that comes up in different forms in different you know religions and practices. And the problem is, you, after a while, you start to look at the practices and not the deep spiritual insight. And I think it's as true of movements as it's true of individuals and their spiritual experiences. So, you know, for me, what's interesting about Quakers is the is the initial fire that Fox had, which seemed like, in my reading, to be a very genuine and real uh, mystical experience. You know, whether or not, you know, every 
many, many mystics then link their insight or whatever it is to the great other spiritual leaders that they consider themselves to be in, in the in the train of. And I think that's how you get the mistake of saying, you know, the kingdom of heaven is <laughs> uh, coming coming soon to a place near you. Um, but you know, a more mystical approach is about individuals coming to this deeper thing rather than having um, you know, surface level practices that people adhere to, which is what you were describing as the the, the churches of the day uh, as they changed and then along comes Fox. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but I'm, I'm interested to link Quakerism back to Fox's mystical experiences and how well that's been structured into an organization that is, uh, you know, being effective in the material world and giving people uh, validation of, a, of an inner spiritual life. I think the th uh, mystical experience, the main one which Fox highlights is his, um, the light um, over the darkness and the darkness couldn't consume the light, which he had before he met Martha Simmons. <clears throat> Martha Simmons was almost certainly the first person who um, introduced him to a, a coherent um, vision of um, religion, which he could run with. He'd been uh, unhappy with uh, a lot of his other encounters, uh, though he he he'd picked he he'd all picked up some things himself. And then he continued after meeting Martha Simmons to meet with other people, some of them who even led congregations and some of them who just met in private houses who were developing forms of worship and group discipline already. Uh, uh, terms like overseers and elders were in use, um, not as codified as we have them and as Quakers codified them 20, 30 years later. But he was picking up ideas throughout that period. But yes, he he, um, he does seem to have been prone to mystical experiences. Um, I think a lot of people are if they're exerting themselves on an empty stomach. Uh, it's quite often helpful, whether you're Paul on the road to Damascus, um, uh, George Fox over Pendle Hill, or Ben Pink Dandelion on a Greyhound bus. Um, mystical experiences um, do, and that's not for nothing that fasting is one of the major traditions of just about every religion. Um, mystical experiences are very real and they are very often set people for life. They, they can draw on the, their mystical experience to reinforce their um, lifestyle and beliefs for the rest of their life. They're, they're, they're significant not to be poo-pooed, they're real. Um, but um, I'm afraid I haven't had one so. I can't speak from personal mystical experience. Um, but the the idea that Fox invented all these things, he didn't. He accumulated them from the network he got in touch with through um I mean Martha Simmons, he he was in he was passed on to Martha Simmons from somebody else. But yes, um that the network which led from him meeting Martha Simmons, I've forgotten the year now, but it's about 50 or 51. I think it, that took him about two years to get to Swarton Hall. Radical action wasn't particularly, in terms of our modern sense of it, wasn't particularly um, deliberately done by early Quakers, except in their um, aggression towards magistrates. Um, and telling magistrates what to do, and um, uh, them, um, and their unwillingness to um, take oaths, and also their unwillingness to use the clergy for weddings and burials, which meant very early establishment of burial grounds. But they they weren't actually into setting up um, charitable or political subgroups to further things as that I can think of. Not until people like, um, what's his name, who set up the workhouse in Bristol. That's a generation later. Richard. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks, Barney. Um, lo lots of thoughts going through my head. Um, uh, it started, uh, but, uh, the first bit of interest to me was when we started to look at, you were starting to talk about the way Quakers are and were and and evangelism and attracting new members and the, the fluctuation of that. And, and what I got from that is uh, um, we, we, have, we have changed, as other religions have, uh, to capture the opportunities that seem to present them. Uh, we've been pragmatic at times as as a as a as a group. Whether individuals have delivery, I don't know. But it made me think um, as we think about um, trying to do outreach. Um, maybe we shouldn't do it unless we've all been to see the Book of Mormon, uh, which is which is a wonderfully uh, irreverent take on the way that. Um, in a particular circumstance, someone tried to attract more people by being very pragmatic. Um, it, it's it's a, it's a wonderful thing, but um, but but beyond that, I, I, I'm interested. We we we. It's, it, this is a very um, brain-led, intellectual discussion of the history, and when we look back at um, history, I've, I've often seen programs where they they talk about a history that I was a part of. They talk about the way the 50s were like this and the 60s were like that. And then along came the 70s and it was different. And they 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 put some artificial dividing lines in there that that that, that aren't anything like how it felt for people at the time who were in slightly different pockets. I and mean, the, the 50s hung on uh, in certain areas of um, poverty in England well into the 90s. Um, and you just have to look at some of the photographic histories of, of um, working class people to see that the images I have of the 50s in my life were very much the same images that, that, that some people in the Northeast were having, you know, way, way into my, my 30s and, and beyond. So, so history is never linear. It, it's, it's very moving and it, it's made up of individuals. Um, and I think you've illustrated that, that, that it's not one person that does things. It's not the movement that does things. It's it's the combination of people working and thinking together. <laughs> and that that what I was interested, what I was coming back to is those that have read the friend this week. There's an article in there about um, Woolman in the in 1758 and uh, battles in America. History I don't understand never been a part of but I was particularly interested in this situation at the end where where um this guy was asked to um accommodate some soldiers and he, he's a pacifist doesn't you know whatever but he's 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 being friendly but he, he refuses to take money um and it says here confronted with the possibility of being paid to provide accommodation for soldiers Woolman looked into his own heart to find a response to this new and unexpected challenge he refused to take the money before he even had words to explain why. And it was only later that he had an explanation and felt a need to clarify things and avoid ambiguity. So the next day he went to explain his actions to someone. The, the, the thought came after the response. Um, and I think um, whether that's a minor example of mystical experience, David, I don't know, but it's certainly the uh, someone who's got a, a values built deep inside them that they can only respond to in a certain way and they don't lead it by the thinking. And, and I think perhaps these days, that's where we need to be radical um, individually um, and and collectively, uh, and and we tend not to. We we tend to think first, and talk it through rather than actually speak from deep spiritual meaning and experience. Given given a moment of silence, so. It's discussing this last night in the context of uh, even in business now, there's a training program that's offered more through communities than to businesses, which is based on getting groups to a state of silence. 
This is a teacher at MIT called Otto Sharma, who grew up in on a, on a Steiner farm, on a biodynamic farm in Germany, uh, in the Steiner tradition. And he talks about presencing and how the future that wants to emerge only comes where in a state of open mind, open heart and open will. And it, it's very interesting to hear a successful business trainer. He's one of the most successful trainers in the world. And his course is free, uh, which is, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, the, it's the radical shift. And um, I think of the, the potential, and, and, and I, I link in my mind, Quakerism with what Steiner's, what, what, sorry, not Steiner, what Sharma is doing, what Otto Sharma is doing, because he's validating individual mystical experience and linking it all the way through to action in the world, which Quakers have done for hundreds of years. But this guy has come up with another package. And these are, to me, the, the, the layers in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as mystical experience. And then there's these layers. He said some things came later. And it's like uh, in my own life, I, I had some kind of mystical experience when I was young. I learned to meditate. Um, and went through a series of periods where I was adding sort of stacks of competencies in my life. And, uh, you know, and uh, Maslow, Maslow refers to this as becoming self-actualized eventually. It's not that you have the peak experience, but then you're able to somehow carry it with you in the world. And the, the great mystics are doing that, as, as you say, uh, completely intuitively and spontaneously. Woolman is just responding before thinking. There, there isn't the intellect or anything getting in the way of the direct spirited response. So, and I, I think Quakers, Quakers intuitively and experientially have a better experience of all of this than pretty much any other religion in the UK. I, I sort of, in my own mind, I, 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 I smile inwardly that Quakers call themselves a, a kind of Christian religion, but they take them the trouble to write their own red book, you know. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, and it's sort of, no, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't need a Bible, you know, the, the sum total of our collective experience is, is a guide. And uh, I find that, you know, it's, it's I, I just find it really interesting, which is this this is this is the attraction to me of Quakerism and the people involved in Quakerism. But it, it would not be interesting to me if I couldn't tra trace it back to some kind of deep inner mystical experience of of the divine one way or another. And then how that gets integrated with our experience of being, you know, in a material world. Would like somehow more to be in, you know. I grew up in a very working class community, you know, into the fact that uh, my father was a Marxist, and he died before he died when I was eighteen, so I was not able to have this kind of conversation with him, with me being a discovered Quaker and him being. You know, religion, terrible stuff type of thing, you know, so it's, it's this dialect, and the thing which I think Quakers need to be more than anything else is to get back a, a bit more to the, this religion is for everybody this is uh, Quakerism is wonderful, because I, I believe it is, you know, but it needs to be more we need to see in our meetings more shop workers and carpenters and electricians and and lots of other different type of people but because if you look at a lot of quakers these days you know uh, i'll be going to yearly meeting in the end of july but i you know the the amount of people are going to that 
will be your teachers, your doctors, your social workers, your uh, professors of universities and all this type of thing. Uh, Quakers need to have more of a banded idea of society rather than the, 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 the thing which we've got into at the moment. You know, I am a fault for that as well. You know, I was the first of my family to go to university. You know, I was, I would say I am a middle class man already, but we need to change if we're going to survive, I think. The points I'd like to add into that is that, yes, the Society of Friends is a result of a lot of individuals doing and thinking their things, and um, uh, and that changes the body as a whole over time. Um, and um, it, it, at any one period in time, you've got different Quakers thinking and doing different things, and then it's only back in time you think, oh, they did that in that time and they did that in that century and so on. Um, but it was, it was always gradual individual um, bits which made up the whole and you can look at the drift of the whole, but all resulting from individual things. But then there's the question of what do we do now? Um, now, we could think of something which would be very popular, which we... Um, which was um, we knew would be popular, but we also knew would be wrong, and we could promote that heavily. That obviously not going to work. We're not going to um, adopt something which is to us seems wrong and do that enthusiastically just because it will attract people. Um, we may need to be brave enough to do things which we want to do, even if we're not quite sure they're right. Um, that um, we don't necessarily knock them around the Society of Friends until there's a minute of yearly meeting. Um, for instance, we never had a minute of yearly meeting saying we should all shake hands with each other at the end of meeting for worship. Uh, we never had a minute of yearly meeting saying we should arrange our chairs and benches in circles and squares rather than facing the elders' bench. These things were done individually by different meetings on different dates across the country and um, I, going back I was a bit rude to Gordon about um, uh, biting back against uh, the Methodists as an example um, but um, I do wonder whether we um, are very stuck in the mud over our um, meeting for worship the sacred hour of silence and the total lack of programming and um, collective um, sharing of ways of worshipping and how to worship and doing things together in worship um, but just allowing just throwing people in the deep end for an hour and hoping they like it um, but I, I, I think there's possible quite a lot we could do things which we would actually like doing together in worship um, apart from the um, minimalist one hour silence which we tend to observe at the moment As an irreverent suggestion, Barney, you may remember it when we were in Taunton looking at um, uh, meetings working together. One of the questions was about the uh, the, the, the numbers and the, the diet. And, and I suggested that um, uh, actually if, if we really did in, in England and Britain start to reduce our numbers so much, then uh, Kenyan missionaries would be sent over to rescue us. And they'd introduce some uh, different kinds of worship for sure. Very good, very good. Uh, Roger. Um, yeah. uh, thanks very much for that. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, a, a number of bits and pieces come together in my thoughts over the, the, the last few minutes. Uh, one is the, the uh, point that I think Richard made about um, uh, woman. Um, knowing that he shouldn't charge without uh, 
uh, uh, analyzing it and, and understanding why he why he felt that um it reminded me of uh, a, a, a statement that i came across when i was working in personal and social education many 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 years ago um that pointed out that uh, attitudes tend to follow behavior rather than the other way around um now I, I, I think that's a very uh, simplified over over generalization but i suspect that the origin of attitudes tends to be related to behavior um and um uh, and the question is is the behavior driven by the uh in uh, like in woman's case where it was clearly founded in his in his own um uh spiritual experience um or whether the behavior is based on social pressures or whatever, or our, our own uh, uh, less less than desirable desires and, and all that. Um, but it, it, it's a very important way of, of thinking about the way in which we arrive at our, our, our attitudes. Um, on the question of, um, of program worship, uh, I, I love the idea of Kenya sending over missionaries. Um, I mean, it's come to me very clearly in the just quite recently how uh, the, if you like, the root um, basis of of uh, the Quakerism that we practice is to be found in uh, Fox's experience of there was Christ, one Jesus Christ who could speak to my condition. Um, he, he was taking very very seriously and deeply the uh, the. the um, the teaching of Jesus. Um, and my experience of Kenyan Quakers, uh, and, and I'm sure that it would probably be found elsewhere in the evangelical Quaker world, though I sometimes doubt it in one or two places, um, the, um, is a very, very close relationship with Jesus. Um, now, it, I think it's fouled up by the evangelical message of of uh, taking the the biblical text literally, uh, and and that and that seems to me totally wrong. Um, but but the foundation of it is this is this um, uh, uh, very very uh, clear relationship to the person of Jesus. Um, and then thirdly, the idea of of more programming. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not not averse to it, and uh, and uh, I mean, one of the things that, that when I was in a Quaker school, of course, was that uh, that uh, while well, we had traditional Quaker worship on Sunday morning, on Sunday evening we had an evening had, had an evening meeting which was programmed, uh, and uh, I think that was absolutely the right thing. Um, the danger is, uh, from my experience of visiting Quaker churches all over the world, um, is that the uh, the silence can get lost because it's hard. Uh, I, I never remember. I never forget going to two um, um, Friends United meeting, uh, the mainstream pastoral Quaker meetings in. Um, uh, well, I think I'm not. Sure. Yeah, I think it was actually in, in Virginia, um, close to Virginia Beach, at the northern end of Virginia. Uh, but would have that, that area that would have been part of Baltimore me meeting uh, yearly meeting, um, uh, but the, uh, the the these two um, pastoral churches only had one pastor, and the I went and I went to both of them at different times, <laughs> and one uh, was very like a, 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 a meeting that we had. I mean, there was a little bit of programming, but not very much, but no, and no music, just, just a, a, I think, a, a short sermon or a Bible reading, I can't really remember, but it was very uh, plain. While the other one uh, was sort of full programming, but with a space for, for silence in the middle. And I found the silence completely dead. It just hadn't, didn't have any... Uh, I mean that may have been only my experience, and it may be that the the the, the uh, friends who were used to it gained more from it than I did. But I got the feeling that it was um, something that the pastor liked, and uh, therefore uh, you did it. Uh, and, and you don't get much silence in in Kenyan typical Kenyan uh, French church uh, uh, services. Um, wonderful experiences as they are uh, I, I, I really enjoy 
taking part in them, even when I'm uh, nobbled on the way in to say, uh, "Oh, would you take? Would you bring the message?" <laughs> um, and the first time that happened to me, I fortunately had a bit of paper in my pocket. I anticipated it, but it's uh, it, it's um, there's a spontaneity about the about the ministry and in in those those meetings that um, that I that I, I welcome, but it but that, but not much silence, I'm afraid. Because I am like that. I'm going to tell you a small story about uh, silence and that type of thing. My a friend of mine became an Anglican priest, a lovely chap, known him for quite a lot of my life. You know, so I went to his first service, and it was lovely. And uh, just, you know, sing, sit down, stand up, study up. And in the middle of it, we had a little silence, mm. and I liked that. And so I said to him afterwards, I said, George, a uh, marvellous survey, mate, a uh, service, mate, but a bit of Quakerism in there, slight silence. And he said, well, oh, Ray, no, he said, silence, dangerous stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can, I can um, uh, uh, follow that on. When I was at college in Cambridge, I, I attended with the first, my first year particularly. I was a member of the college choir, and I used to go to the services regularly. And uh, on one occasion, the dean asked me to lead the lead the prayers, and of course, I said, uh, you know, "Yeah, I'll, I'll lead the prayers as long as you, let me. I can do it my way." And um, and it, it, uh, I said that my, the, that that our, my approach was 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 in silence, and uh, uh, obviously, if anyone has something that they wish to 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 share, uh, that's fine. The dean lasted fifteen seconds. <laughs> that that was um, uh, Hugh Montefiore, who became Bishop of Birmingham. Lovely man, a wonderful man, but. <laughs> Any more comments and questions for Barney, folks? Richard. Yeah, very, very quickly, because um, I think, but um, it, it's exploring this, you know, throwing them into a, an hour's silence and hoping they like it thing. I mean, it, it, it has triggered my mind a lot. Um, my experience in, in Kenya uh, in, in Nairobi, and I'm sure it's different around, you know, I have a very limited experience, but, but that, that was interesting because you actually had in the same location two kinds of worship going on at the same time. Uh, you had the big church service, which was packed and full of songs and preaching and goodness knows what, uh, and, and even a sheep auction the first time I was there. Um, very lively and and then you also had the um unstructured meeting based on silence happening effectively in a side room um and the um the whole catechism the way the way that people were brought into the friends church in um nairobi that they 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 had to experience both they were they were bedded in the structured meeting uh but they they came in to the silent meeting and respected that so they had a they had both things happening and you could you could move between them um and it wasn't a disturbance to the silence that was in the room when we were sitting in our unstructured meeting that people would come in and sit quietly for 10 or 15 minutes and then go out again and back into song and noise and that that was quite a frequent occurrence and you know in some of our meeting houses we could do that um We've had discussions. Um, uh, some people feel disturbed by the presence of children in the meeting for worship because the noise, the distraction is is is, up, is difficult for them to centre down in. Um, they can always nip next door to the library, and sit in silence. Um, they could come and go, um, and you know maybe maybe we have a bit more flexibility like that. We have a quiet space that people can 
go into when what we're doing as the main thing is something a bit more vibrant. Just a thought. Well done, friends. I think we've come to that thing called the natural break. Uh, so thank you, Barney, for stimulating a, 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 a wonderful talk. And I think we all appreciated it. Uh, September is the next time you will see us together. And according to Patsy, I am to take the first one in September. And it is going to be something which may interest you and hopefully will interest others. It is about the development of DNA and how the scientific development of this, which affects us all. And I will hopefully raise a few moral questions on that and where it is going. Where do we want to do it? And David Saunders shakes his head. <laughs> so uh, do come to the next one, because I think you'll be interested, David. I'm looking forward to September, Ray. <laughs> okay. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you.